and there we are all right so yes good morning good morning good morning how many of you are happy and thankful that you have made it to Friday? <laughs> Friday and yes, Friday. It's both of them for me. I'm excited. I'm thankful <clears throat> that I'm in the land of the living. I'm thankful that I'm getting over whatever this is because um, I can't get over it the way other people do. I cannot take uh, any of those crazy antibiotics that people prescribe to you. So I have to do what I do naturally and let time take its course. And uh, I've also been uh, doing a little bit of what I do when I have a cold now, and that is I utilize some natural things like applesauce, believe it or not. Um, that saying, an apple a day keeps the doctor away, actually has some truth to it. So uh, eating applesauce is very helpful when dealing with uh, colds. It's also a natural teeth cleaner. And drinking hot chocolate is very good for your body, particularly um, the dark chocolate, hot chocolate. So if you drink hot chocolate, make sure you're not drinking the milk chocolate, that you're actually drinking um, the dark chocolate. But guess what I just found out? Mm hmm we're already into our subject for today by the way health and business so this is a little health tip that I just found out about um, this actually can be found at GNC so if you have a GNC in your area um, and you want to get into the power of cacao or the dark chocolate powder uh, this is what they carry it's raw organic cacao powder which is awesome so you know where I'm gonna be going to get me some raw chocolate and um, you can add this powder to your favorite smoothie you can add it to yogurt and you can add it to drinks to create all kinds of healthy chocolate treats but now that I have found out that they have raw cacao powder guess who's gonna be over there stocking up all right, so you can get that from GNC. All right, let's talk a little bit. We're back in these two books, The Little Book of Business Wisdom from Business Legends and The Power of Small, Why Little Things Make All the Difference. So we're going to go into The Power of Small first. And then we're going to do go into the little book of business wisdom and we're going to be done today. So I don't anticipate that we're going to be long. All right. And before we get into that, before I forget, I do want to um, thank those of you who are <clears throat> choosing to help with Daring Dialogues, those of you who are choosing to um, give to the work that we're doing here. Um, I want to say thank you to those of you who have decided to be um, subscribers. If you have a question about what does that mean um, to subscribe to Daring Dialogues or to become a, a regular supporter, you can email me at reachshante at gmail.com. Again, that's reachshante at gmail.com. And I will fill you in on what it takes to subscribe. And um, just know that we have some things in the works for our subscribers that I will be presenting and hopefully rolling out in the next few weeks. All right. So the power of small, why little things make all the difference. And we have been talking in uh, the chapter about small truths. And we covered last time we covered truth number three and truth number four. Truth number three was everyone matters. And we talked about how these people, these small group of uh, senior citizens in West Palm Beach uh, threw off an election that a lot of people were angry about. <laughs> and um, that was because they didn't really believe that their votes mattered, but turns out that their votes did matter, especially in the state of Florida. And then truth number four, we talked about how a little good goes a long way. And it was an incident with a man uh, who was just being helpful, but him being helpful 
he happened to be helpful to a person who was of, of a high rank who was able to give him a great recommendation that furthered and promoted his personal life and career. All right. So we're going back and we're going to cover truth number one and truth number two. Truth number one, it's a bite size world. The digital age, like it or not, has condensed planet Earth into a cozy community of about 7 billion citizens and is shrinking by the nanosecond. So what are they saying? They're saying because we live in a digital age, it is easier to connect with human beings all over the world and all over the planet. This is something that we need to understand, especially if you are a leader and especially if you plan to do global ministry. Now is actually easier to do global ministry than it was in the past, okay? Because I don't have to get on a plane and go to Italy. I can host a broadcast and I can um, have those who are in Italy who contact me, right? I can actually even set them up, have them set up a Periscope account and I can just click on people who live only in Italy who subscribe to me and I can do a special broadcast directly to them. So I don't have to, I don't even have to leave my house to do international or global ministry. The other piece of that that she's saying here is that it has brought us into a close community. It's easier to talk with people that you may not have ever um, ever would have thought that you might have talked to in real life. I think that one of the powers of social media is I get a chance to uh, talk to and communicate with people that I, you know, maybe look up to or admire for what they're doing in terms of their writing or what they're doing in terms of activism. I can now get on my computer. I can inbox them through Facebook. And guess what? Some of them talk back and some of them respond. Whereas in the past, you wouldn't have had that kind of access to people who are famous or people who are well known. So that's one of the things that the digital age has done. However, <laughs> as many people are coming to realize that sometimes people take that access to communication with you and they become too familiar with you or they begin to think that they have a relationship with you that they don't necessarily have simply because they have a better way to access you, okay? And so sometimes people kind of take on this idea that they own a person because they have access to a person. And um, so people need to be mindful of that and they need to be careful of that. And I think a lot of times, um, especially those who are considered famous or those who are now con who are considered celebrities are starting to realize that even in how much they expose of themselves, they can have unintended consequences as to people's reaction to them. Because again, like, like we're saying, the more access a person has to you, even if it's only fiber optic access, meaning they only know you through your Facebook account or they only know you through your Twitter account or they only know you through your Snapchat or your Instagram. The more that you're letting people into your life in a fiber optic way, the more it gives them a sense of feeling as if they know you, even though they only know you through your digital imprint. Does that make any sense? And so they might take your digital imprint and they might come to conclusions about you that are either positive or negative. So you have to be mindful of what you're saying and what you're putting up. Now, as I was uh, sharing with my husband last night, I said, there are some people that regardless of how kindly you speak the truth, some of what you say or your calling in life per se, just it just may be controversial. And so as much as you try to be PC or politically correct, there are certain things that you may bring up or certain topics that you may bring up or certain discussions that you may have that are just going to rub some people the wrong way. So we're not talking about living your life in fear. We're simply saying 
being mindful that we live in a different age than we did in the past. We live in an age where people have greater access to you through different means. And we live in an age where your digital imprint is now almost like a resume or a calling card. Some people, even businesses we know, that when they're considering hiring someone, they will actually go and check and see if you have a Facebook page or they'll check and see if you have an Instagram. And, you know, most people put their set their posts or put their posts on public. And so even if you have the majority of things on your page set to private, they can still through um, a, a regular web search engine like Google, they can still go and see what you have posted publicly. Um, even if your page is set to only friends for the most part. So there are certain things that they can just type in your name and they can actually look at the last things or um, last comments you have made and post it publicly. So one thing I always encourage people to do is every now and then go to the Google web engine and search engine and type in your own name and hit the search bar and you'll see what comes up about yourself. It's good to know um, what is being uh, put into the digital world permanently about you. All right. I remember doing that one time and then I found out that um, I was being talked about in a good way on somebody's um, magazine site. They were talking about um, blogs and they were talking about hidden gem blogs and some of the best blogs out there that people didn't know about. And they had actually given me some props and mentioned my blog and I didn't even know about it. So it's always a good way to kind of check what is being said about yourself. Put your name in the search engine and hit search. You can also put your name in the Google search engine and hit images. And you can see how many of your personal images are coming up on the World Wide Web. Um, sometimes people don't set their pictures to friends only or they don't set their pictures to private. So your pictures are just floating around the Internet. And um, when you're talking about rights to things and, and rights to your privacy, sometimes people can pull your images um, through web search engines like Google. And next thing you know, you find your picture in somebody's advertisement, but they didn't ask you. But you set your image on public when you posted it up. All right. So you have to um, just be thinking about those kinds of things when you're talking about protecting yourself in the digital age and thinking about the impact that you can make in the digital age. All right. And yeah, I only read one sentence of this book. <laughs> so let me keep reading. Today, our neighborhoods have transcended all physical boundaries. As we console each other in chat rooms, as we talk in our blogospheres and are probably more likely to be in constant contact with a friend who lives across the country than one who maybe lives across the street, we're LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and Googled at all hours of the day and night. From spanning the globe to finding our soulmates, to, bring, to hiring a personal assistant in India for as little as $7 an hour, which you can do through a website called taskseveryday.com, the power to improve our lives and livelihoods is but a keystroke away. We put the small planet effect to good use at the Kaplan Thaler Group, saving millions of dollars in time and money. When we decided to deepen our digital advertising capabilities, for example, we took on a select group of internet savvy employees and outsourced our myriad flash design and coding projects as far away as Costa Rica and Mumbai, saving time and money for our clients in the process. In advertising, we often create animatics or cartoon versions of a TV spot so clients can test our commercial ideas before they are produced live on film. Executing prototype ads used to take two to three weeks precious time that delays a campaign from airing and ultimately selling product. But Ezra Krause, the founder of Animated Storyboard, found an ingenious way to make time disappear. 
With studios set up in New York, Tel Aviv, and Bangkok, projects essentially follow the sun with work flowing from one international team to the next as the day ends in one time zone and draws in dawns in another. By using Ezra's company, we look like heroes to our clients by having a very realistic test commercial virtually overnight. But a bite-sized world also means we are all but a click away from being totally visible and vulnerable to virtually everyone else on the planet. Every website visit and purchase we make is transparent. Every email can end up making front page news as one law firm we know learned of firsthand. The law firm had a partner who repeatedly berated his staff via email. In fact, he once ranted that their performance was so shoddy, he was shocked they still had any clients. A week later, the partner fired one of the lawyers who happily emailed the partner's abusive notes to their local newspaper. Needless to say, all their clients read it and, nearly put, and it nearly put the firm out of business. Forget about swimming in a cyber fishbowl, we're paramecia prancing under a microscope, all dressed in see-through shirts. Did you forget to stop at the light? You may be outed at runaredlight.com. Is your yard an overgrown eyesore? Check out the photographic evidence the busybody down the block posted on rottenneighbor.com. Even a news brief in a local paper can ignite a controversy and launch a YouTube crusade. When a teacher in Florida had kindergartners vote on whether or not to banish a disruptive classmate, it wasn't just brought to the attention of the principal or the PTA to resolve. Thousands of internet petitions demanding the teacher's dismissal immediately bombarded the school district from around the world. In fact, one of the most notorious outlaws in our ultra visible new world happens to be a young South Korean woman who thanks to the internet will forever be known as dog poop girl. When the woman's lap dog relieved itself on the floor of a subway train in South Korea, other passengers urged the owner to clean it up and even offer her tissues. The woman refused and said something rude and then got off the train, leaving the mess behind. But another passenger had photographed the incident and posted the pictures on a popular Korean blog. Within hours, the dog owner was the subject of national ridicule. Her identity and personal details about her past were posted and she was recognized and jeered in public. Soon, media outlets around the world were reporting the story of Dog Poop Girl. The public humiliation reportedly forced her to drop out of her university and post an online warning that further harassment might drive her to suicide. Our point? Today, all the world really is a stage, empowering each of us to steal the spotlight. But it's our performance that will ultimately determine our fate. Be observant of the small things that potentially can make or break your performance. Train yourself to use the Zoom lens in your career and private life. Whether you're in charge of a $10 million operating budget or just the annual family reunion, don't overlook that one item that seems almost too trivial to worry about. Your ability to pay attention to the smallest details can set you apart from your competitors. Overlooking it can leave you in their dust. So again, we live in a different age. One of the things I say time and time again is I look at my childhood and I look at my teenage years and I say to myself, I am so thankful that social media was not then because I can't only imagine all of the things that would be online about myself as a teenager because I was not a goody two shoes, okay? But we are not teaching that. I don't believe that we're teaching the significance of that to younger people, especially those that are 18 and under. Um, I don't think that we are helping them to understand that some of their immature decisions that they're posting now, okay, because they think it's cute and they think it's fun and they think it's frivolous and they think there are no consequences to it, all of that remains in cyberspace as a permanent imprint. Even if they go back and they erase certain things, um, the digital imprint is still there permanently in cyberspace. And I don't think that a lot of times we don't tell young people that. 
Um, we don't sit them down and have the conversation about what they are posting and what they are sharing online. But of course we know the conversation needs to be had. Truth number two, small acts tell a larger story. Small acts tell a larger story. When Linda first decided to open the Kaplan Thaler Group, <clears throat> she had one piece of Clairol's hair care business, Herbal Essences Shampoo, which she naively thought she could run from her Man Manhattan brownstone. Steve Sadov, her sole client and then president of Clairol, tactfully suggested that Linda would at least need a business partner since her expertise was in the creative side of advertising. <clears throat> Considering she had never run a company or earned a business degree, Linda reluctantly agreed. Flipping through her Rolodex, she went on a frenzied search for a perfect partner. She wanted someone brilliant, assertive, collaborative, and challenging. The last person she was looking for was a yes woman. She instinctively knew she needed someone with the moxie to tell her if the work was veering off track or if her genius campaign idea would send the client's company into bankruptcy. She needed to hire an alter ego. After watching Linda eliminate more prospects than an American Idol audition, Steve stepped in again. He urged her to contact Robin Caval, who handled a number of other Clairol accounts at a large New York ad agency. Linda arranged to meet Robin at Michael's Muffins, a neighborhood coffee shop, whose Formica decor was a far cry from the power breakfast venue. Robin was intrigued. As fate would have it, she was also a tad hungry. When Linda walked in, there sat Robin at one of the wobbly tables with a bran muffin in front of her. She promptly introduced herself. It's great to meet you. I ordered a bran muffin and it was huge, so I thought we might share it. Of course, if you want your own muffin or a different kind, I'll just save this for later. It was a business partner move at first bite. Linda realized that this simple gesture revealed more about Robin than a resume or references ever could. She had shown herself to be proactive, frugal, collaborative, and willing to take the initiative, even if the task was only ordering breakfast. Within an hour, a partnership began to take root. 11 years and 200 employees later, the Kaplan Thaler Group remains the only agency of its size in America founded and run by women and is consistently ranked as one of the fastest growing agencies in the country. Getting there wasn't a piece of cake, but it started with half a muffin. You can learn so much from the small details in life. Does an interviewee look you in the eye or does he or she look away? signaling a sense of insecurity or a lack of interest. How many business relationships and personal relationships get off on the wrong foot because of a miscue or a lost moment? Marriage counselors will tell you that the rolling of a spouse's eyes in the course of a therapy session can signal impending divorce long before an attorney is hired. That one reflexive action often comes from a deep well of contempt and resentment. Analysts and pollsters know too well that voters don't remember the big issues in political debates. It is the smaller moments like a candidate's sneering retort or a witty one-liner that is often the turning point. And if you really want to learn about a prospective employer, hours of Googling may not reveal what a few minutes in the reception area will. If you arrive five or 10 minutes early and just drink in the atmosphere, are people sequestered in their offices behind closed doors? Are they wandering in and out and talking to each other? When the phone rings, what kind of corporate image does the receptionist convey? Is she cold and prideful or casual and friendly? Doing online research beforehand is a great idea, of course, but don't stop there. Your eyes, your ears, and sometimes your intuition can yield something no search engine can dig up the subtle signs that speak to a company's culture and atmosphere. And I have known that to be true in my own life, even if it's not necessarily um, a business uh, setting or looking to, to uh, meet with a client or looking to interview for a job, just showing up early can tell you a lot about a situation or an environment. Like they said, 
When you show up early, you have time to observe what's happening in the space. You have time to observe what's happening uh, with people. I was sharing, I think on my um, page online the other day, I was talking about looking for neighborhoods and for people who are getting ready to, to move or they're searching for a new place to live. How do you know that this is going to be a neighborhood that is going to be safe? Or how do you know that this is going to be a neighborhood um, that that you want to live in or a neighborhood that builds or has a sense of community in it? Two things that I look for in a neighborhood. One thing that I look for, even if I'm driving into other people's neighborhood, is are there pedestrians? Are there people walking around? Um, if it's evening time, are there still people walking around? Um, because what does that say to me? That says it's safe enough to walk outside. It's safe enough to be on foot in this neighborhood. So to me, that's an indication of the safety level of a neighborhood. Do people feel comfortable or do people feel safe walking around? And guess what? If you're black in America, that matters. Might not matter for somebody else, but if you're black in America, it matters whether or not you can safely walk around your neighborhood with somebody without somebody calling the cops and saying there's somebody suspicious walking around and you live in the neighborhood. The second thing that, that I look for is, are there children outside playing together? And I'm not just saying um, black children, but are there children outside playing? Black, white, Hispanic, well rather Latino, not Hispanic, but Asian, Indian, are there children outside that's another indication of safety in a neighborhood because parents tend to not allow their children to play outside if a neighborhood is unsafe. So if I go in and I see children and they're outside and they're playing and they're playing with each other, this is a good thing. Um, it can be an indicator of the parents in the community's cultural understanding and their cultural, their tolerance for other people of different cultures as well. Um, people who tend to hold uh, bigoted or prejudiced ideas tend not to allow their children to play with people from other cultures. So those are two things that I look at when I um, go through a neighborhood. Are there people outside? Are people walking, taking a bike ride, etc.? And are there children outside and are they playing together? <laughs> not by themselves not sitting in their, in their lawn, you know, off to themselves, but is there child interaction in the neighborhood? Now, I know some people who don't want to live in a neighborhood with a lot of children, so I understand that. But I'm talking about me personally, how can I tell whether or not it's an environment that would be safe and family friendly, okay? Let's go to our next book, The Little Book of Business Wisdom, Rules of Success for More Than 50 Business Legends. And we're going to look at two today. All right. This one comes from John H. Patterson. John H. Patterson was considered the father of modern salesmanship. He was a great communicator and motivator who founded the National Cash Register Company. After attending Dartmouth College, he eventually went to work managing a coal yard and a company store for the employees. The store was always in the red because the cashiers were skimming. Mm, mm, mm. And it was then that Patterson decided to give a new contraption to try, Riddy's Incorruptible Cashier, which tabulated sales. He bought the two registers in 1882 and in 1884, he decided to buy the entire company, changing the name. His sales innovations included establishing equitable sales quota systems, codifying sales talk, and producing one of the first sales manuals that surely included these principles for communicating. So, principles for conveying an idea. If I should reduce my principles of idea conveying to a creed, it would run something in this fashion. Number one, the nerves from the eyes to the brain are many times larger than those from the ears to the brain. Therefore, when possible, 
to use a picture instead of words. Use one and make the words mere connectives for the pictures. And I think we have been talking about that on Wednesdays with our book, Draw to Win. And if you are on next Wednesday, Lord willing, we're going to be talking about seven building blocks, seven uh, ways and seven images that you can use to draw just about anything to get your point across. So if you're going to participate in that next week, Wednesday, the Lord says the same. Um, make sure you have a blank piece of paper and a marker and a pen. All right. Cause we're going to do some drawing. Number two, confine the attention to the exact subject by drawing outlines and putting the divisions. When we make certain that we are, then we make certain we are talking about the same thing. Number three, aim for dramatic effects, either in speaking or writing. Study them out beforehand. This holds the attention. Number four, red is the best color to attract and hold attention. Therefore, use plenty of it. Number five, few words, short sentences, small words, big ideas. Number six, tell your why as well as your how. Don't just give people process give people an understanding of why you chose to go with a certain process. Number seven, do not be afraid of big type and do not put too much on a page. Number eight, do not crowd ideas in speaking or writing. No advertisement is big enough for two ideas. Number nine, before you try to convince anyone else, make sure that you are convinced yourself. If you cannot convince yourself, drop the subject. Do not try to put over anything on anyone. And number 10, tell the truth. Um, people think that uh, I'm joking when I say I, I could not do direct uh, or network marketing. Um, I've tried. Um, I have plenty of friends who are in network marketing. Some of them sell health products. Some of them sell energy products. Uh, some of them sell, uh, what do you call it? Like jewelry and, and some of them sell candles and scents and all of that. Okay. But what he just said is absolutely true. <laughs> if you can't convince yourself of a product, drop the subject. So, I am not good at network marketing. So when people ask me, do I want to join a network marketing team? I'm going to always tell them no, because I don't, I, I don't have that skill of selling a product. I don't. Here's the key. I don't have the skill of selling something that I don't be necessarily believe in. All right. And I know with a lot of network marketing, it is all about the sell. It is all about the draw. It is all about drawing people in. All right. The other thing they don't tell you with a network marketing business is that you have to have um, the ability to reach a large clientele to get started. If you're a person that, that doesn't um, have a space where you're engaging in a lot of people all the time, it will be hard to get a network marketing company off the ground. All right. So I always try to tell people sell. If you're going to be ha if you're going to produce a product, sell something you believe in. See that up there. I believe in it. See that music back there. I believe in it. Sell what you believe in. If you have a product, um, try out your own product. There are a lot of people who are in network marketing who have never tried out the products that they're selling to people, but they're very good at selling products to people, but they themselves have not tried out the product. Okay. Thank you, darling. <laughs> so, um, I hope that's helpful. That was a very good, that was a very good list of things. He talked about your space. That when you're set, when you are producing something or when you are presenting something, don't cram a whole lot of information onto, um, onto one 
board or one presentation. If you look at in social media, some of the best advertising that you'll see is maybe something that has three to five words on it and maybe it's colorful. And we know that people are really into using GIFs right now and they're really, um, really into using animation. A very good animation app, if you haven't heard of it, is Legend. Legend is a very good animation app. It allows you to put in background pictures. It allows you to type in um, three to five words. And then it does, it, it already has like preset color backgrounds and also preset animations. I use it a lot um, when I'm doing quick advertisements online. I also use it to do birthday shout outs to people who are my friends just to kind of personalize um, me uh, connecting with them in social media land. And so you want to look at less is more. I think as my husband said down there, less is more. You're trying to get your idea out. And then if a person wants more information, then they'll be drawn in by the initial thing that you put out. And then they can ask more questions about the details. But you don't want to overwhelm people, especially with advertising. All right. Our last one for today is coming from Andrew S. Grove. Andrew S. Grove. <clears throat> Intel's chairman, Andrew Grove, made famous the motto, only the paranoid survive. <laughs> only the paranoid survive. A philosophy developed and necessary in his own youth. Life was more than a challenge growing up Jewish in Hungary during World War II. His father was taken to a labor camp and his mother and he survived the Nazi occupation by obtaining false papers. When the Soviets invaded Hungary in 1956, Grove chose to escape to the United States. After earning a PhD in chemical engineering from the University of California, Berkeley, Grove went to work for Fairchild Semiconductor where he met the future founders of Intel, Gordon Moore and Robert Noyce. Grove, who has managed his career by continually asking himself how to add value, joined them at Intel in 1968 and became president in 1979. He later added the titles of CEO and chairman. Managing your own career. As a general rule, you have to accept that no matter where you work, you are not an employee. You are in a business with one employee yourself. You are in competition with millions of similar businesses, millions of others all over the world, picking up the pace, capable of doing the same work that you can do. And they're perhaps more eager to do it and more excited about doing it. The point is, the cliches of globalization and the information revolution have real meaning, potentially deadly meaning for your career. The sad news is nobody owes you a career. You own it as a sole proprietor. I can offer you no, no surefire formula for success, but here are three key questions. All right. So he's, he's telling you, that no matter where you work, you are responsible for managing your own career. You may be an employee for somebody and you may change up where you work, but he's basically saying that you are the guide for your own career. You are the one who's going to decide how long you're going to be with a company, what you're going to learn from that company. I always try to um, encourage people that even if you're starting at the ground level in a business or a company, learn all you can above your minimum. Sometimes people get into a field and they're only learning what, what the minimum requirements are. They're only learning the basics, but that's not how you're going to stand out. And what you want to be doing is you want to be picking up skills while you're there 
that what we that are what we call transferable skills. All right. My first job as a teacher out of college, I was over the art club. <laughs> I was teaching uh, K through 12. I was teaching all subjects. So I was teaching my my degree subject art. Then I was also teaching math up to algebra two. I was teaching history. I was teaching um, reading to younger students. So I developed the ability to not just teach my subject matter. I developed and sharpened my skills in teaching all kinds of subject matters. I also served as the school's librarian. So I was responsible for learning the library system and learning data and learning input and deciding what materials um, came into our school library and what materials needed to stay out. So I became a gatekeeper of knowledge for my school. So guess what? Later in life, when I'm working in another area, okay, I have more skills than the average teacher. So guess who got hired over some other people? Because I could do more things. They got more for their dollar out of me than they would have somebody else who only um, specialized in one subject matter. All right. So let's talk about these key questions. All right. He says, number one, continually ask, am I adding real value or merely passing information along? How do you add more value? By continually looking for ways to make things truly better in your organization. One of the things that makes people stand out is if you are trying to make things better wherever you are. And the other thing that makes you stand out is you are, if you're the person who's always making things worse for the organization. So you do not want to be the person who is known as every time you come around, things get worse or people can't find things or things are out of place. You want to be on the other side of that, truly making things better for your organization. In principle, every hour of your day should be spent increasing the output or the value of the output of the people for whom you're responsible and you're responsible to. Question number two, continually ask, am I plugged into what's happening around me? Some people, they go to work, they're in their little cubicle, they're in their little corner, and they tune everything out and they think they're doing a good job. But then when they get a pink slip, they're trying to figure out where did the pink slip come from? I, most people will say, well, I don't understand why I got fired because I come in, I don't talk to anybody. I maybe get my cup of coffee. I sit at my desk. I might put my headphones on. Maybe you do data entry or something like that. I put my headphones on and I'm in my zone and I get my work done for the day. And then I clock out and I go home. That's part of the problem. Question number two, am I plugged into what's happening around me? Am I understanding my company's culture? Am I understanding the company, the industry? Are you connected to a network of plugged in people or are you floating by yourself? Are you trying to understand the company beyond your specific work requirements? Or do you only come in and isolate yourself away from everyone else? Are you personable? Are you looking back at the company manuals to see if anything has changed? I know some people who have been at companies, they've been there 10, 15, 20 years, but guess what? We are now moving into an age where people will tell you the 10, 15, 20 year jobs are being replaced because you have people who are working multiple jobs. You have, you have different ways that people are setting up their business structures. You have companies that have said after about five years, we either want to, uh, we either want to change who's in a position or we want to cross train people 
so that they're not just stuck in one area of a company. So you have to understand that business models are changing, which means you have to be plugged into what's happening with your company and understanding your industry in order to stay current. Question number three, are you trying new ideas, new techniques, and new technologies? And I mean personally. People do not always face up to changes they have to deal with, yet you can't be ready for the future until you survive the crucible of change. I'll say that again. You can't be ready for the future until you've survived the crucible of change. And the key to survival is to learn to add more value today and every single day. Learn to add value to yourself. Learn to add value to your skills that you already have. Don't be afraid to get online and take free courses and learn new stuff. Learn how to operate what you already know. Learn how to operate it better. All right. These are called, as we close, these are called strategic inflection points. Major change in the competitive landscape can take many forms. It may be the introduction of new technology, a new regulatory environment, or a sudden shift in customer preference. But the change usually hits the organization in such a way that those of us in senior management are among the last to notice. Such monumental changes represent what I call strategic inflection points, events that cause you to fundamentally change your business strategy. At such points in the life of an organization, nothing less will do. The best difficulty with strategic inflection points, aside from the havoc they create, is distinguishing them from the many changes that routinely impinge on your business. Obviously, not every change we respond to requires a dramatic reaction, but the answers to three questions may signal the onset of such a change. Question number one, has the company of the entity that you most worry about shifted? I have a mental silver bullet test. If you had one bullet, what would you shoot with it? If you change the direction of the gun, that is one of the signals that you may be dealing with something more than an ordinary shift in a competitive landscape. So here's an example. Many people are not paying attention to the shift that most companies are moving online. Tap some hearts on the screen if you understand that most of the economy very shortly and very quickly is moving online. Okay, one person. (laughs) Go look up, this is some homework for you over the weekend. Google number of companies going online. And I'm not talking about they're gonna keep their brick and mortar. I'm talking about they're closing their brick and mortar and going completely online. That is a major shift. And if they aren't going online, they're a company that's merging with another company because they're realizing that most people are going online to buy their goods. They are cutting out the middleman. They're cutting out the need to put gas in their car, to drive to wherever, to go stand in line, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes to get something to buy. That's a major shift and a lot of people are not paying attention. And so if major retailers are going completely online You as a person, especially if you're in small business, you have to be thinking about, are my products available for purchase online? Can people get to my products without me having to drive them to them or without me having to set up at a conference and give them my products? Can I send them a link that if they say, hey, I want to order your product right now, do you have a a online store? Do you have a link where you can send them to order your product online immediately? So if you are in business right now and you cannot answer that question, 
you're already in trouble. Okay. One of the many, one of the many things that I heard from small business owners, especially those who were in disaster stricken areas. One of the things that they're saying that has been saving them as small business owners is the fact that they already had online, their online stores and online businesses set up so that they could continue to sell products even while they were going through their own personal crisis. Their business did not stop because they had an online store. They had a way to continue to do business even though maybe their physical business was destroyed in areas like Hurricane Harvey. All right, number two, is your key complementer a company whose work you rely on to make your product more available changing? So for those of us who are authors, for example, and we use companies like Amazon or we use companies like CreateSpace to do our distribution for us, you have to look at are those companies changing? Are the companies that you use to get your products out, are they changing their model? And if they are, then what does that mean for you? So you need to be looking ahead. A shift in direction by a partner or a market ally can be as decisive as a move by a competitor. Number three, do the people you have worked for seem to be talking gibberish? In other words, are they suddenly talking about people, products, methods, processes, or companies that nobody's even heard of or that you have no understanding of? If so, it's time for you to pay attention to what is going on. It's time for you to learn the new language. All right. So. He, those were strategic inflection points, as they say. The next part of this book we'll be looking at are the Wall Street Wizards. They're going to be offering some business savvy advice. So I hope that you'll be able to tune into that on next week. This has been another edition, another session of Daring Dialogues. I am your host, Shante Charles. I hope that you will join us again next week. We'll be back with our Motivation Monday and we'll be talking in the book and looking at Kingdom Discipleship and Biblical Hospitality on Monday. Also, if you want to contact me, if you have a show suggestion or if you have a subject matter that you think that would be interesting for us to cover, um, please email me at reachshante at gmail.com. If you are interested in supporting the program, you can also um, give a one-time donation through the PayPal, which is located in my bio. Or if you want to hear more about the We Dare Squad and what it means to subscribe, you can also e email me, excuse me, at reachante at gmail.com. Well, remember, light is the most daring opposition to darkness, so please go out today and be a light. Thank you again so much for your time and your attention. All right. And we will be back this Sunday at 2.30 p.m. So if you're interested in what we do as a ministry in our teaching, we're on here um, Sundays at 2.30 p.m. Uh, my husband, Apostle Robert, will be back as we talk more about dismantling doctrines of devils. All right. So until then, take care and God bless. And thank you again for those of you who are watching YouTube live stream. You can also email me at reachshante at gmail.com if you have any questions or you have any show topic suggestions. Thank you again for viewing. Take care and God bless.